Oh, yeah, perfect. Okay, ready? Here we go. Here we go. Welcome back to the Successful Working Parents Podcast, the podcast where we talk to successful working parents. My guest today, she is a media educator. She specializes in the impact of new communication technologies on society, family, and children. She is a mother of one, ladies and gentlemen, Gwyneth Jackaway. Gwyneth, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Anthony. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes, appreciate your time. So um, we have a lot of exciting stuff that we want to talk about, but if you wouldn't mind just giving a really quick background on your career so our audience can know a little bit more about you. Sure. So <clears throat> as you uh, mentioned in your kind introduction, I'm a media educator. Uh, I am an academic by training and trade. Um, I spent almost three decades on the faculty at Fordham University in the Department of Communication and Media Studies. My training was focused on both uh, American history and communications, and I'm especially interested in the impact of new media on society from a historical perspective and also um, the <laughs> remarkable changes that we're all living through right now. So from the introduction to, of the printing press and the telephone through uh, all the changes that we're living through today. Each time a new communication technology arrives, many things change, and that's what I've always researched and taught about and thought about. And um, I left higher ed a few years ago uh, to bring the kinds of things that I used to teach in the classroom uh, to a broader audience. And um, my current focus is on bringing some of this kind of teaching into secondary ed, so middle school and high school, when so many kids are getting on social media. And I think that uh, we all need some help with this since it's really a, a new development in human communication. And none of us were trained on how to parent in the digital age. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, you and I were chatting before. And well, first of all, I did go to Fordham. I think we did. We might have overlapped, right? I, I graduated in 2009. So I, I was probably there when you were a professor. Yes. But I was saying, oh, I'm so glad I just missed that this app era when I was at college. I mean, the smartphone, the iPhone came out, I think, in 08 or 09, and no one That's really right. had it. And so there was no apps. There's no dating apps. And so you had to take pictures with your with your <laughs> camera and, and upload them, connect to your computer to get your Facebook pictures in there. So I'm really glad I, I missed some of that stuff. Well, it's interesting that you say that you're glad that you missed it. So that indicates that you recognize that, that there may be some challenges. New communication technologies bring a lot of benefits, but they also, um, because communication is such a, an essential part of being human, when there's a new way to do it, lots of other aspects of the human experience can be impacted. Yeah, absolutely. So this is an area that you specialize in. I, I'd be interested to hear... You mentioned kind of since the printing press. So it'll be interesting to hear your thoughts on how media has affected child development and the way we see the world, maybe even before we get into the digital age. Sure. So <clears throat> what a great question. So first a few thoughts on parenting, and then I'll talk about how media have impacted childhood. Sure. So obviously... Um, when children first emerge into the world, and I know that you've just welcomed your daughter, so congratulations on that. Thank um, you. you know, their first contact is with a relatively small group of adults and maybe some other children, if there's already other kids in the vicinity or in the family, and maybe some animals. And, and that's how they're learning about the world from just the immediate humans or, or other creatures around them. And that's historically and traditionally been just a small group of people. And then as we began to connect to the rest of the world through various media forms, the kinds of input and stimulus that can reach a young brain have increased, right? So not necessarily so much an infant, although people put babies in front of TVs and people put um, phones and iPads in the hands of toddlers. Um, but mediated communication connects us with people far away. And that's both wonderful and it can also be challenging, especially if the people far away are sending or transmitting or the, peop the children are accessing ideas and information that the family may not sanction or a kind of stimulus that the parents may not want the kids to have. And so 
Mediated communication brings outside stimulus into the home and into the family setting. And that has historically posed a lot of stress or challenge for parents who want, understandably want to contain and control who accesses their kids. Um, so there's a long standing uh, history and tradition of parents expressing concerns about the kinds of things that kids are exposed to through media forms. And that goes back at, at that we know of, that there are records certainly back into the 19th century when people were worried that kids were spending too much time reading, which is really funny because of course now that's seen as a benefit. But in the 19th century when uh, uh, portable paperbacks became available, there were kids who were sitting and reading a lot and people worried that they weren't getting enough exercise and they weren't talking to people and they weren't interacting with the world. And now, of course, we see that kind of behavior as desirable. Yeah. Um, and then once the uh, 20th century got started and you have radio and film and, and later television, there was you know, a lot of concern about that. And, uh, and now those media forms seem tame in comparison to some of what's available today. Yeah. So that's, that is interesting. I, I wanted to just ask you really quickly, people want their kids to be reading more now. I, I didn't know that people were worried about kids reading too much when, I, when books first became readily available. Do you think that 200 years from now, they'll be like, man, I wish, I wish kids were using apps more. I wish they were on their phone more. Well, one thing that I have learned as a historian is that it's dangerous to make predictions. Uh, so... I, what I do think is that we tend to be frightened of things that are new and nostalgic for things that are familiar. Yeah. So it could be that once, and I don't think this is unrealistic, you know, the, the so-called metaverse doesn't seem to be kicking off quite as expected yet, but I think it's just a matter of time. <clears throat> and then we may look back on, these newer forms of social media with nostalgia for some reason, I'm not sure what it would be, but mm -hmm. it's, it's what's familiar. It will be what was familiar for, for let's say your generation of young parents who knows what's coming in 30 or 50 or a hundred years. Very true. Um, so tell us a little bit more about the effects. Let's, let's move into the, the digital age. So what are some of the things that we know are happening when people are interacting too much with with digital media and, and what are some things that we, we're not sure about but we think? So you just asked an enormously broad question. So I wanna, if it's okay, just narrow it down a little bit so I can give a, a thoughtful and careful yeah. answer. So <clears throat> one thing to know up front as I answer this question is that we're really in, even though it may feel like, oh, the stuff's been around for 20 years, why don't we know more? Science moves slowly and doing carefully controlled um, scientific research where you make sure that you have good sampling, sample size, representation of different kinds of groups, different socioeconomic experiences, um, and then tracking th changes over time, all of that kind of research ta takes time. So we're still at a new, you know, at the relatively cutting edge stage of gathering reliable data on the impact of social media. So I just want to say that up front. <clears throat> Nonetheless, we are starting to see various trends. However, it's also important to remember that the concept of the child isn't one thing. So you have a newborn, I have a 20 year old, <laughs> They're both people, sure. <laughs> but because their brains are developing at different rates and at different stages and they've had different life experiences thus far, exposing them to digital stimulus is going to have very different responses. So it's not easy to say there's one clear impact for all humans. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps the best approach for us is to think about different age groups. So... Let's talk about little kids. So right now you have a brand new human, <laughs> hot off the presses with a brand new brain and 
not yet a lot of external stimulus other than what she heard and experienced during gestation and the experience she's had for the past few days, <laughs> you know, outside. That's a very different kind of brain than an older brain. And what we do know is that for the first few years of development, children need a great deal of interaction, um, eye contact, um, <clears throat> vocal interaction. So she, obviously she won't be speaking anytime soon, but she's hearing you and your partner speaking I'm assuming English or whatever other languages that she's exposed to, and that will prime her brain eventually for language development. Yeah. So at this stage, if you put her in front of a screen or, you know, and she wouldn't actually have the grasping capacity to hold a, a phone or an iPad yet, but if you put something in front of her, she would look at it, but it would just be light and color and sound. But yeah. she would be processing something. Now, what's the impact of digital media on babies? That's a very hard study to do. <laughs> but what we know a lot more about is what's the impact on babies if their parents are never looking at them because their parents are looking at their phones. Sure. <laughs> or their parents are always looking at the screen. So I would say that one answer to your marvelous question about what's the impact of digital media on people is that one of the impacts is that we are all more screen focused and looking less at one another. Now, I don't want to idealize the good old days as if once upon a time we all stared deeply into each other's eyes and had wonderful, meaningful interaction. Of course, that was not the case. But it was less likely that your parents would always have their face in a screen. Yeah. So kids who are not looked at a lot and kids who are not um, heard and seen, therefore, because if their parents are always distracted or half paying attention or, or have their ear pods in, that's going to impact their brain development. We know yeah. that for sure. So I'm just going to pause there because I don't want to yeah. make this too abstract. No, that's um, well, obviously super pertinent to my current situation. It's funny right. thinking about what she's absorbing and it's hard to do a study on that and what the impact is, but five years from now we can talk again and we'll see what, uh, <laughs> you know, she, she definitely has absorbed some reality TV since she, <laughs> since she came home from sitting on the know. couch. Uh, so we'll see if, uh, you know, if the bachelor is having a, a negative impact on her in the future. When, when yeah, I, I mean, was, I, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. When, when my son was a baby, uh, he was born in 2002 and not long after the, the war in Iraq began, um, mm. the second one. Sure. So I, I was watching a lot of news and pretty negative news and I was holding him and nursing him and wondering, you know, is he absorbing this in any way? And of course I have no way of knowing, but I, now as I look back on it, I am fairly certain that he must have been absorbing my anxiety about it. Yeah, yeah. Because I was anxious and I was upset and I was nursing and I was holding him in my arms and I was consuming news that upset me. And I think that's another important thing for parents to keep in mind is that when they're really little, excuse me, when they're really little, it's easy to imagine. They have no idea what this is. I can watch whatever I want. And they probably can't understand, you know, obviously before they have language, they can't understand the words, but they feel your body energy. You know, anybody who has a pet knows that pets tune oh, into yeah. our moods. And so that's, I would say, you know, one of my pieces of advice for you uh, as a new parent is be mindful of the kind of media you consume around your daughter and for your audience, you know, for people to be aware that kids are always watching and learning from us. So how we react to media forms around them is teaching them all kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm also thinking a lot about what you said about how much you're interacting with the child or looking at them versus being distracted. I mean, we're definitely in the moment of we're just making sure <laughs> she's breathing at every second. Right. But I, I, I'd right. be lying if I said I didn't, I hadn't been on my phone even while I am, I have, I have held her and, and looked at that's things right. on my phone really quickly. Right. So that's really interesting. People give me the advice of even, 
having your having you know a good audio book a good podcast while you're kind of taking care of the baby because it just gets pretty like you know monotonous and mm -hmm. helps kind of pass the time but it's really interesting to think about not being fully present while you're doing that so do you recommend really trying to just be in the moment as much as possible in those you know in those hours of of rocking and burping and and, and holding <laughs> well of course it's <clears throat> having been there i know that those uh hours can pass very slowly. So, you know, one thing that I like to say to parents of young children is the hours are long and the days are short. Yeah. And there's going to be a moment when she walks out the door and goes to college. <laughs> and I know that must seem like a thousand years from now, but you'll also hear older parents say it goes by so fast. And, you know, it sounds so cliche, but one of the ways to, to, I guess acknowledge that is to be as present as possible. Now, of course, that's not as easy. It's easy to say, harder to do. Um, and I think that listening to audio content may have benefits over video content because you can be maintaining eye contact Yeah. when her eyes are open, you know. And if it's nice content that's not upsetting you, <laughs> then your body energy can stay peaceful. But that is certainly something that I think is also quite relevant for parenting in the digital age and ultimately for teaching older children about how to live well in the digital age, which is to prioritize human co-presence. It doesn't mean we can't take out our phones. They're valuable, our, our iPads, our computers, but human contact matters. And uh, I know, uh, <clears throat> so I'm here in New York City and you know, you walk on the streets and people have their faces down. People cross the streets with <laughs> looking at phones. I've seen people ride bicycles looking at phones. Um, I think one of the most valuable things we could teach young people about life in the digital age is the skill of intentional attention. So the way that digital media platforms are designed is they're designed to capture your attention. There's a reason you get sent notifications. So the thumbs, you know, the notifications on your screen that pop up or the, the sounds and, you know, oh, someone liked your picture or someone responded to your post. That's all designed to get you to stay as um, interact, you know, to as engaged with the platform as possible so that you see the advertising. So these platforms are designed to hijack our attention. It's the, it's the economic model of digital media. Get as much of our attention as possible. So a lot of times our attention is just being captured throughout the day by various things and we ricochet from one crisis to another or one stimulus to another. And if you can teach kids, like, where are you gonna put your attention right now? For the next 10 minutes, I'm gonna be present with you. And then as they get older and you can begin to explain, daddy has a job, mom has a job, we need to be focused on other things right now, but at this time, you know, once they learn how to tell time, you can say at this time, I'll be present with you or I'll pay attention to you. And that can also help you teach them eventually about how to limit their digital media use. So you can have 10 minutes on the iPad playing your favorite game and then we're going to turn it off and we're going to read a book or that sort of thing. Yeah. Before we get into younger kids and, and how to limit their usage, I just want to understand a little bit clearer <clears throat> what are the ramifications of let's say okay let's say i have a newborn we're watching tv all day with her on the couch i'm on i'm on tiktok while i'm taking care of her what do the studies say are going to be some of the potential negative side effects of doing that so this is where i want to be cautious because you know ultimately the best study to answer that kind of thing would have uh several groups of kids one group that was heavily exposed to this, that kind of family situation and then other, you know, and then at least one other group, a control group of kids who are not. So you would have, and then you would have to track them over years. So that's a hard study to do. You have to get families to agree to being monitored. And, and so we still need a lot of data, but 
the initial research suggests that if parents are not as engaged linguistically and visually, then you could have other kinds of problems. So de language delay is one kind of problem, social emotional issues in terms of connecting, turn taking, um, being able to have successful social interactions or behavioral problems. So if kids learn that uh, one way to get, get the parent to look up from their pad is to act out. <laughs> so then, you know, if they act badly, dad will put down the pad and, or the phone or the computer and, and interact. And it might be a negative interaction, but at least it's attention, right? So kids want our attention. And if they have trouble getting it, they'll yell louder in whatever form that takes for them. Or if they're really not getting the attention that they need at home from their parents, they're going to, as they're older, they'll seek it elsewhere. Yeah, that makes Those sense. Those early years are, are, are crucial. And, <clears throat> you know, being as present as possible for other humans, it, it's challenging. But teach, when I became a, a mom, and I'm, I'm happy to talk some more about what that was like for me as a working parent, um, as an educator, I saw becoming a parent as the biggest teaching job that I had ever had, that I ever will have. Um, now I'm doing a new kind of teaching as my son is really entering adulthood. I'm trying to teach him about that. But we can't be teaching well if we're not present. Yeah. So if you're listening to this and you're holding a baby, <laughs> put the phone down and get back to the baby, please. <clears throat> so, okay. So I hadn't really thought about that. So that's definitely a, a new fear unlocked. So I'll, I will keep that in <laughs> mind. But, but what I have thought a lot about, especially with a daughter is her own screen time and her own, you know, digital footprint once she <clears throat> can actually be on Facebook and Instagram and whatever, whatever apps are available at that time. So let's talk a little bit more about that when they are, you know, in the toddler phase and then in the adolescent phase, I guess it's probably two different things, but so let's right. maybe go through you know, the next stage. Great. So one, one thing that I would love to talk about that I don't see discussed as much, although I'm starting to see some articles about it in the context of influencers and their children, um, momfluencers or, you know, uh, <clears throat> various kinds of people who have been posting a lot about their babies who are then becoming toddlers, who are then becoming children. And all of this posting of imagery without the consent of the young human. <clears throat> so that's a really interesting and new sort of issue of privacy and images and who owns those images. And um, when my son was small, Facebook was new. Actually, when he was really tiny, there was no social media for which I'm great, grateful. <laughs> um, because I know I would have been one of those moms posting tons and tons of photos. And I don't think that it's especially problematic when they're really little. But um, I remember the day that my son asked me to not post a picture of him, a certain picture that he didn't like. And, you know, and it hit me like, oh, I've been posting all these images of him, not thinking about how he feels about it. <laughs> so that's something for adults to think about. One way to address it is to make a closed friend group, a private friend group in your Instagram or Facebook or wherever you are. Um, if you, I understand it's a very natural desire to share images of your family, but if you make it private so that at least it's people that you know and not strangers, that might be one step. Um, in terms of once they begin to consume social media and then once they can begin to post and create their own images, those are um, uh, two topics. So you mentioned as a daughter. So I'm not sure what you had in mind, but one of the concerns for, for girls, <clears throat> for some boys as well, but it seems to be more of an issue for girls is that especially TikTok and Instagram, an image, any kind of uh, platform that emphasizes imagery as opposed to, let's say, Twitter, 
and whatever else is coming, threads and whatever else is coming in its wake. Um, we have a society that tends to focus on appearance for females over appearance for males. So, and what that tends to lead to is a hyper focus on certain body parts. And when they're really small and they're not yet adolescent, they can already start to absorb the message in our society that being thin is better than not being thin. And so there's, there's evidence that kids as, as young as seven, eight, nine girls are dieting and talking about dieting or talking about concerns about their appearance. That's not, that's not unique to social media. These kinds of, when I was growing up, it was Vogue magazine and all kinds of fashion magazines. And, um, you know, the, the trend towards trends towards anorexia and bulimia were starting in the eighties. So that was before social media. So I want to be careful not to blame it on media, but sure. we live, we live in a society that emphasizes beauty and women and girls absorb pretty early on that to be pretty is good. That to be thin is good to look like certain celebrities is good early on. They start to, you know, they find their media celebrities, whether it's Taylor Swift or whoever is, you know, the celebrity of the day, kids by third, fourth, fifth grade are already being very drawn to pop music and they want to emulate those stars and, there's not especially anything bad about it unless there's, um, you know, a tremendous mismatch. Certain kind of girls are never going to look like Taylor Swift and they shouldn't hate themselves because of that. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. I mean, I, I mean, I remember growing up, like the talk was about the magazines and the, the body image from, from magazines. So that was before That's right. Facebook yeah. and Instagram were doing that. Right. And MTV and you know, just Hollywood and the music industry contributes to all of this as well. So that's one real concern for girls is to make sure that they're exposed to positive, healthy role models of women doing things, not just women being pretty, because of course that's not the only function that, that people yeah. have is, is their appearance. Um, as they grow older, of course, for both genders, there's a concern about Exposure to pornography, and that's a whole conversation that um, that we could dive into. But um, you know, uh, young humans are curious about sexuality, and they become curious about it at different points in their development. And um, now, this is a, a source of information for them about bodies and what bodies look like. And you know, um, I think it's important for parents to have open and honest conversations as early as possible of you're going to run into this. And, you know, what I said to my son is these, you know, at least some of them are paid actors and they're paid for their appearance and they're paid to engage in certain behaviors on camera. And that doesn't necessarily represent what real sexuality is like when there's not a team of cameras <laughs> capturing it all. And they're not actors being paid to perform. Um, yeah. Um, real quick. Also, are you, are, are you still seeing me? Okay. There was a couple of times where you kind of like got a little digitally. Am I still pretty, pretty smooth? Pretty smooth. Every once in a while it freezes, but hopefully our audio is being captured. Okay, great. Um, so, okay. So the big things I'm hearing are in order to kind of prevent some of this is working with the, per the child and personally to work on their own self image and the way that they see the world and then also just actually limiting screen time? Are you, are you a proponent of just time caps or how do you actually physically limit the, the time they're consuming the media? Great question. Okay. So um, I am not a proponent of a specific amount of time. Um, there are various numbers out there that different groups from the American Pediatric Association to various psychological groups and media, um, digital media groups have put out suggestions for different age groups. I don't think that it's a, a question of a magic number, like one hour or two hours. I think the content matters a lot, right? So just like with books, you know, if you read six hours a day, you can read six hours of comic books, you can read six hours of you know, classic literature, they're not equivalent. The time is, is important, 
because there's only 24 hours in a day. <laughs> and, you know, with small children, they're sleeping a, a, a good portion of that, hopefully. And then you think about the rest of the day and what kinds of things should be happening in the rest of the day. There's food consumption, there's social interaction, hopefully there's some exercise. And, you know, there's some amount of time that's available for taking in mediated content. So then you want to, first you want to think about what does a balanced day look like? And maybe there's some other media forms that you want them interacting with, like the printed word or, um, you know, there's interactive digital media and then there's more passive things like watching a movie and watching television. So I don't think it's automatically a question of a number. So that's my first answer. And I think that um, parents who are concerned, so for your, um, your audience members who have children, let's say, who are in elementary school, if they're seeing behavior that indicates that the child is starting to have a problem, and I want to talk about video games in a moment, if things seem out of balance, if they get really resistant regularly when they're being asked to bring their media session to a close, that's a, a warning sign, right? If conflicts start to come up between the parents and child, you know, time to turn off, time, and there's an explosion of conflict, then you begin to realize there's something to work on here. It's gonna make, it makes sense that they would be resistant to stopping in the middle of a movie, you know, all right, well, it's time for dinner. Sure. Um, so you wait till the end of the movie to have dinner. I mean, if parents know a little bit about the media content, that helps. You can't really stop playing a video game in the middle of the game. So if the parent knows a little bit about the game and you know there's levels, you can say, all right, when you get to the next level or when, I think that the modulation of time use has to be targeted to the individual child and to the needs of the family and the, um, and the nature of the specific content that they're consuming. But yes, I think it's a very important to have balanced time use in their use of the uh, digital platforms. And I'm ha happy to talk some more about ways that that can be done. Well, you are an advisor with a digital app called Carrots and Cake. And now this is interesting because, and this is similar to, I, I have a background in, in meditation. I worked at Headspace for a while and you were taught, we were just talking about being more mindful and unplugging, but then it's like, oh, well, here's an app to actually help you unplug from your phone, right? And I, some people found that to be a little bit contradictory to use something digital to do something mindful. Now, this is even more direct, right? This is a digital app to help you, a screen to help you lose, use less screen time essentially, right? So tell us a little bit more about the work you do with Carrots and Cake and a little bit more about them. Okay, great. So yes, I'm an educational consultant with Carrots and Cake, which is a parental control app to help facilitate more, uh, let's say healthy relationships between parents and children around screen time and to facilitate um, a more balanced use of different types of media on the part of the child. So um, I think the best way to describe it is to begin with the name. So carrots and cake um, is, invokes a more uh, kind of old fashioned view of, you know, finish your vegetables before you get to have dessert, right? And the carrots and cake app is designed to encourage young people, children, to consume more educational apps. So, and I'll explain in a moment what that is. And that, and then once they spend some time learning through an app, then they can have as a reward some play time through a different kind of um, platform. So the carrots and, can, carrots and Cake app can be downloaded onto the phone or to the iPad and the parent sets the controls of what counts as a carrot and what counts as the cake app. So a carrot app might be Duolingo or Khan Academy or a Sesame Street uh, um, game and that's learning. So it counts as carrots and it um, helps the child advance their skills in numeracy or literacy or um, various kinds of other uh, skills. And then uh, once they have con uh, completed the 
set amount of time. So maybe the parent says, all right, once you've done 10 minutes of Duolingo and 10 minutes of Khan Academy or 10 minutes of Sesame Street, then you get to have 10 minutes of Roblox or 10 minutes of Minecraft or some thing that's a little, you know, maybe not as learning directed and is more what the child might consider a playful app. So what that does is that it takes the parent out of the punitive role because when the child turn, opens up the app and they say, all right, I want to go on YouTube, the, uh, the iPad won't let them go to YouTube until they do some learning. So to, gotcha. does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I could use this much myself. Well, exactly, right? And so, uh, and to respond to the question that you asked about isn't it kind of ironic to use technology to help alleviate some of the problems of technology? Sure, there's a, a kind of irony there, but carrots and cake is not anti-technology. These tools are tools, right? Just like a knife can be used to uh, clean your fingernails, <laughs> make a sandwich, do surgery, uh, you know, or commit a murder. A knife is a knife, right? Tools are tools. And what yeah. we choose to do with them is where our agency comes in. And so human willpower is not such a strong trait, right? We sure. can get better at willpower. Anybody who's been on a diet knows about this, right? And uh, you, can, you can build up willpower, but you can also get a little assist from the technology. So if you go to turn on and let's say you set up carrots and cake for yourself, right? And maybe you're blocking yourself from going on, I don't know, a news app. I spend too much time consuming news. So I could use carrots and cake to block myself from consuming news because it um, distracts me from things that I should be doing. Um, carrots and cake is very science-based and so uh, we draw from the existing research and there are some things that we do know. And one of the things that we know about um, social media and certain kinds of apps that are very compelling for kids, YouTube um, uh, and a lot of the gaming platforms is that they lead to spikes in a chemical in our brain called dopamine. Dopamine has gotten a lot of attention in recent years. Um, it is um, a chemical that is secreted in our brains and it really in our, and therefore in our bloodstreams as well when we are seeking things and we're seeking rewards. So when you're searching online to shop for something or when you're searching for plane tickets or when you're, you're on the hunt for food, right? It goes back to our ancestral origins of needing to forage for food. There's that sense of engagement and focus. You can see it on the faces of people in uh, Atlantic City gambling. It's that hyper focus. When you watch kids gaming, there's hyper focus. And that's a very pleasurable sensation to have your brain washed in dopamine. But it's addictive, right? And not all of life feels like that. So there are certain online platforms and scrolling the endless scroll through social media that never, it's bottomless if you ever thought about that, right? You scroll and you scroll and you scroll. And there's no bottom. There's always more and there's yeah. always more stimulus and the human brain did not evolve to adapt to all of this input. It's no, nothing in real life is that hyper stimulus. You know, there's not that much stimulus in daily life. There's, as you say, you know, it can be boring to sit there and burp a baby. So we have to train ourselves to learn how to be present for less stimulating things. And so carrots and cake, what we recommend for the carrot apps are things that are lower stimulus to help kids learn that you can um, engage when things are not quite that stimulating. If you know you're gonna get your little stimulus afterwards, right? Just like we work hard and then we know we're gonna go on vacation. Carrots and cake can help a child learn how to engage in something called delayed gratification, which is very useful in life and in school and in, um, you know, getting through hard things. It helps develop grit and resilience and you get the rewards in the game. So learning apps have have some rewards, but they're lower stimulus than um, some of the other, especially gaming environments and social media. Yeah. I mean, I, I could... I could talk to you about this for hours and I could ask you a lot of questions, especially as a, a new father. I have a, a ton I want to learn, but I 
wanted to uh, just get a f- couple more quick questions from you in our last segment. We're going to call Gwyneth's Advice Corner. I'm going to ask you for your advice on a few topics real quick. Is that good? Okay, sure. Okay, great. Well, first of all, you yourself are a successful working parent. So what's the best advice that you could give to somebody who is about to become a parent but still wants to focus on their career? Take care of yourself. That's key, right? So that thing that they say in the airplane, you know, put your oxygen mask on before trying to help others. It's really easy to lose yourself in your early years of parenting in the chaos and tumult and noise of parenting, especially, um, you know, a brand new one. And it can be hard to find even moments. So it might mean getting up 10 minutes early to have time to meditate or stretch or do something for yourself. It's really key to take care of yourself so that you can then be there for your child and then also be there for your career. So that's the first piece of advice I would give. Remember that one day they'll be older and you won't get these years back. And it can be yeah. hard to keep that in mind because it feels very abstract when they're tiny and in diapers and not even speaking yet. But these are precious moments. And so try to keep that in mind because you probably, on your deathbed, you probably won't say, I wish I'd spent less time with my kids and more time working. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> you know, now I understand that. Um, it's going to dep- it depends a lot on people's work environment, their boss, the culture in their, um, you know, whatever company they work for. You may not always get that kind of freedom. And sadly, we don't have a society that really lifts up young uh, working parents. Uh, <clears throat> and that's a whole other conversation about public policy and parenting. I would say that it is important to speak up at work and say that you have things to do for your children and, you know, let your boss or your team know that you're a new parent if they don't know or that you have young children and, you know, explore what the policies are in terms of the perspectives on what is sometimes referred to as work-life balance. I'm not wild about that expression because it implies they're two separate things. Work is part of life. Um, As your children get older, I think it is important and valuable to model to them that sometimes we have responsibilities and we can't always be present with them and for them because a child who always gets all the attention they want at any time is, you know, there's other dangers with that, right? Then they can feel like they're always the center of attention and they can get your attention anytime they want it. And while that may be appropriate when they're pre-verbal, eventually, you know, teaching them Mom's not available right now, but she'll be available at this time or she'll be available, you know, when the clock, when the bell rings, something to teach them some patience. Um, yeah. What other what, questions do you have? Yeah. Um, what advice would you give to your former self? <clears throat> well, some of the advice that I just gave is part of what I would say. <clears throat> Um, so speaking of screen time limits, I'll just give a little, a little broader background here. So when my son was born and I was still, um, a media professor, I began teaching a course called children and media so that I could learn all the research and so that I wouldn't, um, damage him. (laughs) And I guess we'll have to leave it up to him to decide whether I did any damage. But um, <laughs> I, we'll I made, next. yes, well, <laughs> I made the decision not to place strict limits on his media time. In fact, we do we do a lot of bonding through co-viewing, and that's something that I strongly recommend to parents: is watch TV with your kids, play games with them. Um, get to know their media world. Uh, and now my son and I share some of the same fandoms. We're Star Wars fans and Star Trek fans, and we enjoy watching a lot together. I do wish that I had um, 
been a little bit more mindful about how much time he was spending on the computer. Not so much about the content that he consumed, but I think it might have been helpful if I had encouraged him to get outside a little bit more um, Mm -hmm. and do some more activities so that he had a little bit more of a balanced life in terms of his how he was spending his time. Yeah. Last question. You're actually the first guest I've had since I became a father. Um, Uh, I have a (laughs) six day old daughter. So what advice do you have for me as the father of a six day old daughter? So these next few weeks, are going to go by in a blur and you're not going to remember them much. Uh, Obviously take lots of pictures. That doesn't necessarily mean post them all, but um, try to document this moment. I would say be kind to yourselves, um, both of you as you navigate. Uh, Remember that human beings have been doing this for a long time and you will survive. And, you know, be as present as possible for yourself, for her, for each other. Um, It's so magical, a brand new human brain and um, so exciting. So. Thank you. um, uh, And I just want to uh, let people know that there is a six month free trial available for Carrots and Cake. And so they can find out more at carrotsandcake.com. And we're happy to help people out. Um, getting started with a a parental control app that uh, focuses on balance between learning and having fun. And, um, you know, we're we're not anti-technology at all, just very interested in promoting digital wellness and helping families live in a healthy, balanced way in the digital age. Awesome. Well, I'll link to that in the show notes as well. And then where can people go to connect with you or learn more about you? Ah, well, they can... um, they are welcome to reach out to me by email. So it's Gwyneth Jackaway, PhD. So my name, uh, Gwyneth Jackaway, and the letters PhD at gmail.com. Awesome. Well, Gwyneth, I really appreciate your time. This is a really incredible conversation. I'm sure it's going to be really valuable for a lot of our listeners. Thank you. I best of luck to you. Thanks.